Jack, how are you? Can you see me, Mike? I can. You are. Okay. You are perfect. Um, well, and I have. Tell my wife that. <laughs> Only if you tell mine. <laughs> there you go. It's a deal. Sounds good. Uh, well, I got your email this morning, obviously, and uh, hopefully you got mine back that I shared all your links on uh, a mass email this morning. Yeah, I saw that. I appreciate that. Oh, no problem. Are you, are you going to be able to play the recordings for me for them? I can. I'm pretty sure I can play the recording, but realize I can't do two things at once. So I might. No, be no, no. All I want you to do is is um, is a, there's a certain point in the both lectures where I need to play the recording I sent you. Okay. Well, uh, since we have a couple of minutes here and we're waiting for people to come in, let's let's give it a shot. So. Mike, haven't we met before? I'm not sure. Well, you just look familiar to me. When I saw, you know, when I saw the posting with for Campbell that you got the job, I went, I know that guy. Well, hopefully it wasn't from like a blotter or anything like that. But well, it might have been in the post office, you know, and you're, I didn't see the profile, so I don't know. <laughs> you know, holding a TV while running down the street. I don't, I'm not sure. <laughs> no. No. All right, Could've let's. Been I can share computer sound, and then let's see if I can play this. There you go. Can you hear it? Perfect. Sounds great. Excellent. All right. Because I don't know, I don't know what my clientele is going to be, so I don't know, you know, if they're going to be any but people that know that piece. And I've actually over the weekend and and this week I've tweaked my talk to be a little more generic rather than um specific on the whole suite well i i'll i'll uh i'll just say a couple things number one it's been really diverse we've had everything from high school students to college students and teachers in every single that's, what I'm, thinking. that's what I'm thinking yeah and at this about the high school students though not grasping it with some of the theory you know aspects Absolutely. But I was going to say, if you picked a piece that everybody should know, that's one of them. <laughs> everybody should know. I hear you. I hear you. Back I when both of us were younger, everybody did know. Oh, absolutely. I can't tell you how many times I've played that, performed that, conducted that. and You know, the first time I played it, 1969. Wow. Under who? I was, at, I was in junior high. Wow. Our junior high band played it. That is amazing. That you don't hear often. Right. Do you realize that was 51 years ago? No, I'm not going <laughs> to ask you that again. <laughs> right. Thanks. Thanks. So, no, my, I definitely played it when I was uh, probably a sophomore in high school. So, mm -hmm. but. Uh, and and you grew up in New York? What's that? I grew up in New York. Western New York, Niagara Falls. And. And was Bob Washburn teaching at Crane when you went, or was he retired by then? Nope, he was there. He was there. You know, he's my composition teacher. Was he really? Oh, yeah. Oh, man. I adored that man. <laughs> I adored that man. Oh, he, he's a legend at Crane. Yeah. In fact, I just, we'll talk about it later, but I just had a meeting with Oxford University Press about something. And I said, by the way, what have you done with all of Bob Washburn's music from the 70s? Mm -hmm. So I got them actually on it. I don't know if they're going to think about republishing it or giving up the rights and letting somebody else publish it. Right. Boy, anyway. and that's said all the way through. I mean, everything becomes so digital now, but there are so many workhorses that have been forgotten. Uh, I, exactly. I did my graduate work master's at the University of Illinois, and it, it just it will take it would take years to get through that so right right all right uh we have people coming in it's two o'clock and uh it's what do you already? what do you say right. we're doing okay hey everybody my name is dr mike phillips and uh welcome to our inspired to inspire uh series here and uh we are on day three uh, and the two o'clock hour, uh, I do not f 
feel I even need to give this guy an introduction because uh, I've grown up with his name, with his compositions. Uh, matter of fact, uh, before taking this position, um, I, 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 I had a couple of his pieces on my concert uh, when I, before I left Kentucky. So uh, I am a fan, and if, uh, and if you haven't, you're going to hear one at least the next hour uh, airlock, I, I encourage you to uh, airlink, airlink to to stay on. Uh, Jack Stamp, uh, not only writing for the traditional brass band. I know one of your recent uh, projects was actually in Europe and England, uh, but got hit with this whole COVID situation, and uh, and truly uh, one of our current great composers for the wind band. Uh, now for uh, for our own students and uh, and to study, uh, I, I you know that's one question I always have is when you're composing, uh, do you actually think that analytically? But I'll save that for the next next hour. So uh, uh, I'm gonna step aside and I'm gonna kind of drive the ship for him and and, and put up some uh, recordings and score studies. Uh, if you did not receive uh, the downloads or the links, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put those again in the chat here in a few minutes as uh, people start coming in. And uh, without further ado, uh, world renowned, the one, the only, Jack Stamp. Yeah, I think, Mike, you need to be my agent now. Thank <laughs> you. Um, hey, you guys, you can keep your mics off right now, but come on, turn on your cameras. I don't see any of you. I see a picture, picture of Patrick Blackburn. <laughs> That's all I see. Yeah. Come on, you guys, turn on your turn on your cameras. Ah! <laughs> Kaylee and Lily and William and Cooper and Andrew and Evan. Good to see you, Evan. And Emma. And okay, <laughs> sound like Miss Connie on Romper Room, but. <laughs> the first thing, the first thing I want to do is thank Dr. Phillips. I mean, I don't know if you understand the incredible, the incredible amount of work it takes to do something like this. And then couple this with the fact that maybe you don't know that he was just hired this spring to be the director of the athletic bands at Campbell University. And none of this is quote in his contract because i don't know if I, i'm not going to ask you mike but i doubt you're even getting paid anything from campbell yet no i'm running off but, love i'm running off love but, yeah but you know <laughs> he has such experience in music ed that he set this virtual band camp up just out of his obviously out of his love for music and because of the current situation the first thing that excites me about that is that energy coming to Campbell University, a place that I taught, where I taught beginning 32 years ago. I got huge so, feet to fill. <laughs> so get your pencils out. All right, write this name down. Dr. Richard McKee, M-C-K-E-E. -E. And write this down. Dr. John Robertson, R-O-B-E-R-S-O-N. Dr. McKee is head of the Division of Fine Arts at Campbell. Dr. Robertson is a friend of mine, but he's also a vice president at Campbell University. I'd give you the president's number, but I, his email, but I bet he'd be too busy. Anyway, Dr. McKee's email is just McKee, M-C-K-E-E, -E, at Campbell.edu. Dr. Robertson's is Robertson, R-O-B-E-R-S-O-N, at Campbell.edu. If you liked, I don't know if you've been participating the last two days, and this is your third day. If you like this, the best thing you could do is write those two gentlemen and tell them that you like this and like what Dr. Phillips had done to set this all up. You're too kind. No, I, if this was a private conversation, I would say something to you now, but it is. Um, and write this down, J. Edward Stamp 54. So it's letter J, the name Edward, and then Stamp, and then the number 54. That was the year I was born. 
So it looks like jedwardstamp54 at gmail.com. That's my email. So if you want to get in touch with me after we do this, that's fine. If you want to Facebook friend me, that's fine. The problem is I get so many friend requests by people I don't even know. Somehow it'd be really good to know that you were on this chat. So I don't know if you could email me and say, I want to Facebook friend you, and then I'll have your name in my head. Anyway, that being said, I don't know the background of all of you. Some of you look, I don't know if we have any high school students. We have some, certainly some, um, looks like some college students and, and some, hopefully some directors, conductors. But I'm going to talk about on this conducting portion, I'm going to talk about something that rarely gets talked about in the way I'm going to talk about it. In fact, I might be the first person to actually talk about this. At least I'm going to say I am until you can prove me wrong. But Oh, let's first say you need, a, you need to have a handout that says the thought process when studying a piece of music. That should be one of your downloads. And then some questions about the first suite in E flat, which I know you didn't know you were going to have, and I may answer them for you. And the third is hopefully a link to a score of the whole first suite in E flat if you don't know that piece. You don't necessarily have to know it intimately, but it'd be kind of nice if you had the score, because I'm going to refer specifically to some things I'm talking about within that score. So here's the deal. Hopefully, those of you who are watching, oh, by the way, this is the worst time slot to ever have in a clinic situation the one that's right after lunch, <laughs> because people fall asleep. The beauty of this, and I think for half the people that are already here, because they muted their cameras, is that they're taking naps. So if you feel like you're gonna fall asleep, turn off your camera. I have iced coffee right here, because it is not really good when the conductor fall, I mean, when the clinician falls asleep in his own presentation. So with that being said, Hopefully, you all have a theory background, music theory background. You've had some music theory classes. If you haven't, this might be difficult for you to get your head around, though it's not going to be totally wacko theory. But the fact that if you don't understand how chord progressions work and things like that, or um, how, how music is somewhat put together, it might be a little confusing or over your head. I'll try not to. The problem is, I know there's the conducting session, but obviously if I had you guys conduct it, it would be just kind of meaningless. But let's talk about studying a score. And studying a score from an educator's perspective. Now, I'm not saying that the educator can't be an artistic conductor, but an, educate, an educator conductor has a different response, I won't say a different responsibility, more of a responsibility to their players than a professional conductor because you are teaching music through performance and band. Now, I'm not, um, I'm not pushing the series by GIA, but the title is terrific. See, too many of us teach band rather than teach music through performance and band. And now, how to, how to get music to our, to our students and the way they get it is by playing their instruments which is a way to get to music more intimately than if you're just listening to it with your iPods or whatever. Anyway, point being is that when we're taught in music school, at least for me, but of course I was there a long time ago, but I haven't seen it much change. We're taught to analyze music like a theorist. Remember those wonderful Roman numerals? And that might be fine for a theorist, but that doesn't help you as a conductor at all. Because what that is, is basically a harmonic analysis. That in 20th century, especially if you're trying to do Roman numerals, it doesn't work. So then, can you get this? Can you have access to this handout, this, this the thought process of studying a piece of music? So there's a difference 
between score study and score analysis. Score study is how does a piece go? In other words, where are the pitfalls as a conductor? Yep, you got a retard here, you got three, four here, brass come in here, there's a, there's a fermata here, change of tempo here. You know, you don't have to conduct a key change, <laughs> you know? Players have to play that, but as far as getting through a piece of music, how does it go? is basically this kind of roadmap to get you from the beginning to the end. That's score study. Now, more intense score study is, well, you know, the, the leader of the, of the pack has changed to brass. It was woodwinds, and now it's brass, and now it goes to flute solo. Or, you know, so the orchestration is sometimes is part of that, part of that score, uh, score study. But score analysis is not how does it go, it's what is happening at any particular time in the work. So when the woodwinds come in, what's happening? Is this, is this new music? Is it varied music? Is it repeated? And Mr. Corporon, Eugene Corporon, you may know that name, um, director of wind studies at the University of North Texas, was my major professor when he was teaching at Michigan State. And he said there are only three things in music, new, repeated, and varied. Basically, that's right. So one of the what's is what's happening at a particular time. One of the things in analysis is that you stop and analyze what actually is happening. That makes sense. Composer, though. A composer looks at a piece differently. Now, one of the problems that this hasn't been talked about and this is going to sound a little egotistical, and I don't mean it to be that way. Many composers, in fact, the majority of composers, are really lousy conductors. And I don't know if you've had that experience, and I bet, I bet Dr. Phillips has. But I've been in front of, of composers who just can't conduct. So it doesn't matter how knowledgeable they, they are of, of a work, that they can't show it in their hands. So the transfer of information doesn't happen. And so the idea is that composer conductors though, who can conduct, look at a piece differently than the non-composers. Well, the first thing I always say is anybody can compose. Hey, boy. Yeah. Hey. You wanna turn off your mic? <laughs> okay, it's nice to see you. Anyway. Um, anybody can compose. If you have any musical talent, a little bit of musical talent, because com composition is like 10% talent and 90% hard work. It's not really, you know, I could never compose. No, you can't say everybody can compose. Anyway, it just takes time. So maybe I can get, if you're not a composer, I can get you thinking like a composer when you look at a work, because I think you will glean more information from the piece if you think like a composer. So what the composer does when they look at a work, they go, first, how does it go? What is happening? But then the third question is why? Why is this happening right now? So if you look, I'm kind of jumping around on this handout. Look at the end of, the, of this first handout. So the, the why is, why did the composer choose this particular concept technique at this juncture in the work? What is its function? Is this um, the initiation of something that will be developed? In other words, is this a seed that's been planted that I'm gonna hear later on? Is this the fruition of something planted earlier that maybe I missed? And does this concept technique have an effect on the entire piece? Now, the reason composers look at that is not because they're just incredibly musically intuitive and they want to bring the best of their conducting. No, they're looking for stuff to steal. Stravinsky said, good composers borrow, great composers steal. You're looking for 
techniques and things that you might want to use in your music. That's how composers stay current by looking at other composers' scores. I mean, if you look back in music history, you know, the great composers didn't really have, have terrific composition teachers, but they were like the copyists for the great composers. And they hand wrote, they, they tactily felt notes that composers wrote and saw how music was put together. Anyway, if I can get you to think like a composer, you can get deeper into the piece. Now, what's the point? So you can say you double dated with Gustav Holst on first suite and E flat? No. See, our job in education is to play music that gives them information about musical concepts. So the more concepts, creativity, aspects, whatever, techniques, I can show them in a piece of music, the more they start to understand music. It's more than just pushing down this for an F natural on trumpet. It becomes more than just their instrument. They, they get more into the music. And so my job though, and we could spend a whole hour on this, is to pick music that you can find these things from a composer analysis. And if your music doesn't have those why things in it, it may not be a piece worth playing. So let's back up now. See where it says kind of at the top, there's, there's three stars. It says the analogy, directions to my boyhood home before the advent of GPS. <laughs> so if I was going to go to my boyhood home, here's what I would say I was going to do. I'll get off. I'll get off the beltway at the College Park exit. I'll turn left, go down the hill, go back up to the top of the hill, turn right, go halfway down the block, and my house will be on the left. It's the white picket fence around it. You cannot get there that way. I can. That's score study. Score analysis. Get on 495, which is called the Beltway around DC. Get off at exit 27, College Park head south. At the first light, Edgewood Road, turn left. Go down the hill to the stop sign, go through the stop sign, go back up the hill to the second stop sign. That's 51st Avenue. Turn right. Oh, I gotta, I gotta tell you, let me do it again. Cause I gotta plant a few seeds. So you turn left, come down to Edgewood Road at the stop sign. That's Rhode Island Avenue. Go across Rhode Island Ave Avenue, go across Narragansett Parkway and go up the hill to 51st Avenue. Turn right, cross over two streets and then go down the hill. And my house is 9727 51st Avenue on the left with the white picket fence. That's analysis. Composer analysis. Take 495, get off at College Park X. College Park. Is there a college here? Head south on Route 1. Route 1. Why is it numbered Route 1? Well, if you knew that, it was the first route that went from New York to Florida. Turn left on Edgewood Road. Does Edgewood Road have a meaning? I still don't know, and I'm 66. Come down to the stop sign. That's Rhode Island Avenue. Rhode Island Avenue, all those state roads start in Washington, D.C. Now, College Park, Maryland's 15 miles from Washington, D.C. I, I bet if I turned right on Rhode Island Avenue, I could drive to Washington, D.C. Okay, go across, go across Narragansett Parkway. Well, that's a weird name. I wonder if that's Native American. Go up the top of the hill. Turn right on 51st Avenue, 51st. Is there a 52nd? Is there a 53rd, 54th? Or is there like 50th, 49th, 48th? Does it go that way? I wonder. You see what I mean? Does that make sense? Kind of that analogy? Right, the, the why. All those were why questions to try to get to my house where I grew up. All right. Now, 
let me go back to the situation of trying to analyze a piece of music like a conductor and not like a theorist. Sorry, I got to just check my time. Okay. Look in the middle of, of the handout in bold. You see that acronym, Schmurf? That's from a book. And if you read analysis of the ability to identify what is happening formally at any time in a particular work. From this, we extract functionality in the piece and the musical concepts that enlighten the education of the ensemble members. In his book, Guidelines for Style Analysis, Jan LaRue gives us a wonderful acronym. Now he had Schmurg. I use Schmurf. So if you look then right under it, sound, harmony, melody, rhythm, and form. Those basically are the aspects of a piece of music. So sound, and if you were in front of me, I, would, I wouldn't have this spelled out like this. I would ask you these questions. But since it would, it would take too much time in this setting, sound means the timbre, the orchestration, the scoring, the color. What's going on sound-wise, color-wise? Harmony. Basic definition of harmony is two or more notes sounding simultaneously. And I left one word out of this melody definition and because I, I made this handout up Sunday and I should have gone back and corrected it before I sent it to you. Is a finite, write the word finite, F-I-N-I-T-E, a finite horizontal succession of pitches highlighted by alternating intervals moving in similar or opposite direction. You see, I mean, it's interesting. I, I've asked a bunch of band directors with supposedly music degrees to, to, to describe, give me the definition of a melody and they'll say the main tune. Well, nice. But specifically, what is a melody? Now, that definition I have to say is 95% correct. So if I sang this to you, da 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 da, that's not a melody. That's a scale. Would you agree? And then somebody said, "Well, what about this one, Doctor Stamp?" Da 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 da. And I said, "You got me there." Joy of the world is the descending major scale. But if I sing Amazing Grace to you intervallically, and it's going to be a little sloppy, but you'll get what I mean. Up a fourth, up a third, down a third, up a third, down a second, down a fourth, down a second, up a fourth, up a third, down a third, up a third, down a second, up a fourth. Are you with me? You see that's a succession of intervals, scale-wise with skips going in opposite directions? There you go. Melody. Rhythm. A lot of people say rhythm is the beat, the pulse. Well, I can't deny that, but I have to say, how does rhythm create itself? Well, it's, it's really the alternation of sound and silence. Da, that's not a rhythm. I have to go da, 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 da. See the separation, re-articulation, creates rhythm. Then form is basically the manipulation of those other four aspects of music to putting them into some cohesive organization. Now, this is the beginning of starting to think like a composer in analysis. Why? Because when I write a piece, I look at those five aspects of Schmurf. And I think, which one is going to start my piece? I really do that. Back when I first started writing, back when in 19, my first piece that anybody heard, well, 1974, I was 20 years old, but first piece that ever got published, you know, was I sat at the piano and banged on the piano till I heard something I liked and then I wrote it down, you know, I was pre 
pre-composition. I mean, sorry, pre-computer, I mean. But nowadays, I think about a piece a lot. So how do I want a piece to start? See, we'll schmurf the piece on the next, if you, wanna, if you stick around for the next clinic, the composition clinic, we'll schmurf a piece that I wrote, and I'll show you how I go through that, that process as a composer and how you can look at it as a conductor. But do I want to start the, the piece with a particular sound? Or do I want to start with a particular chord? Or do I have a tune? I want to just start out with a tune. Or is there a particular rhythm? I have to tell you, I was thinking of a rhythm today. And those of you who can kind of visualize this, I was thinking about a 7-8 rhythm, but the 7-8 keeps shifting from 2-2-3 two, two, to 2-3-2. Two, two. And that's, con that's the constant pulse in, the, in a piece. And I'm probably going to write something that starts like that. But see, the genesis of it was rhythm, meter, rhythm. Then, obviously, the, the skill of a composer comes in with form. How do you manipulate all those things into some cohesive musical structure? Does at least th that concept, not how you, how you apply it, but does that concept make some sense to everybody? Of course, I'm only looking at about seven of you. And the rest of you are, say you're here, but you're not, your cameras aren't on, so shame on you. Anyway, all right, so what, what uh, Dr. Phillips is gonna do now is just play the first movement of the host first suite. It's about six minutes, six and a half minutes. So. I want you, if you can get this, look at the score and listen at the same time, do that. We're not hearing it. So maybe you have to turn on your mic. I don't know. We heard it earlier, didn't we? Kaylee, he it's a Kaylee, that's in a a handout that he sent out earlier. Give me a thumbs up if you're hearing it. Nope, nobody's hearing it there, Mike. And you're not on, so mic wise. If you're talking to yourself, you're doing a good job of it, but we can't hear you. Having a little technical problem with the file. Well, darn, because you just played it for me before we started. I know. I, I was, I was feeling proud of myself too. I know. All right. Open the. Oh boy. Tell you what I'm gonna do. And that was the first movement, correct? Correct. I'm gonna see if I can just pull up B. Uh, for some reason, that file is not. Oh, I heard something. Of course, because I'm only improving with age then I ought to be a master. <laughs> <laughs> I've never doubted you with that one. Here we go.
I had to get creative getting it out there. Nope. Oh. Sorry. Now get your scores out. You don't necessarily have to look at me in this spot, but you're going to have to answer me. And don't act like you're students unless you're not a teacher and not answer because you're afraid you're going to be wrong. So see what you do then as a conductor is you smurf the piece. So what I mean by that, you take those concepts and then at a certain section of the piece, you analyze what particular, which one of those particular concepts is happening at that time. So, at the beginning, do we have sound, harmony, melody, rhythm, or form? What's the most important thing? Melody. Melody. Exactly. What's the second most important? Okay, I'll answer, sound. It's who's playing it, right? So, here's the situation. If you have a melody as a conductor, what do you have to think about first? Phrasing. So the first thing you have to decide, you're gonna breathe in the fourth bar. Mm -hmm. Or not. Breathe. My answer is or not, but the other thing is, you've got the tune in octaves. In unison in octaves. What is that, what, what problem will that present? Intonation. Intonation, exactly. So, you already know how you're gonna rehearse this. What's the third thing now? The pieces in octaves, what's the third thing you're gonna have to deal with? So it's, we say it's melody. Cool. Then we talk about the orchestration is in lows and it's in octaves. We have to worry about phrasing. We have to worry about intonation. What's the third thing? Balance. Exactly. Make sure that euphonium is not playing louder than the tubas, which usually happens, depending on how many players you have, right? Make sure that's a, you know, a euphuba <laughs> or tuphonium type sound this starts all right in bar nine what's the most important thing the entrance of the uh, clarinets and the trombones no bar nine there's no clarinet there i'm sorry that's trumpet i was reading the wrong line there is no well, what about the entrance what do we have now you have to worry about your balance there too. No, 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 no. We're smurfing. Okay, sorry. Harmony. Too quick. Harmony. What'd you say, Evan? Harmony. Harmony. We've added harmony now. Now I'll go back to the person who was just talking to me because I can't see you. Uh, not Evan, but the the person who was talking before that. Yes. Then you have to worry about balance. And the problem is you have to worry about balance in the harmony within mm -hmm. the harmony and then balance as relates to the chaconne. Now, if you know that this is a chaconne and you know the piece, you know that that tune that we hear in the first eight bars goes through the entire piece. Yes. So then you, if you look at the questions I have for you, what is a chaconne? And what, what most conductors do, they'll look up what a chaconne is. And a chaconne says, uh, I just looked it up to get like official, so I just didn't do it off the top of my head. Slow piece in triple time, a series of variations, variations over a repeated theme or a reoccurring chord progression. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sorry, a repeated theme in the bass or a re reoccurring chord progression. Well, okay. But the composer in me says, is this a chacon? Well, I don't know if you can, if you have pages, if you can turn to where it says Pizzante, it's after letter B. Do you notice the tune is in the trumpet? 
mm-hmm. or cornet. And you've got bop, 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 bop. So the tune isn't in the bass. No. So is it really a chaconne? I don't know. You see, because if it stays in the bass, do you know what that, really what that's called? Think about Bach. When a theme stays in the bass the whole time. Pasacalia. It's not a Pasacalia. And if a Chacon's definition is Pasacalia, why didn't he call it Pasacalia? So right there, there's some ambiguity in what he calls it and what the, what the um, actual happens on the page. You need to know that. You need to know that because Holst is unbelievable in this piece. Now, I'm going to stop smurfing a minute and ask you to look at those first eight bars. What note of the E flat scale is missing? G. No, no, no. That's in the second full bar, B3. In the first, the pickup or the? A flat. Who said that? Tell me your name. Is that William? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There is no A flat there. Again, that's analysis. Composer would say, why did he leave out A flat? Now, then the composer in me says, I'm not sure this is in E flat. It's an E flat key signature. I'm not sure it's really an E flat. So, what what would lead you to believe? Let's say I'm being um, accused of host malpractice for saying it's not an E flat, and you are my attorney, and you got to get me off the hook here. What would make you? What would have made me think that this may not be an E flat? And it's in these first nine bar, or eight bars. Something again, if you've had theory, then you would you would understand, even though it may you may not be able to recall it right now. Yikes, we're almost out of time, aren't we? Uh we should go to about two fifty, two fifty five to give you a, a little bit of a break in between. So yeah, that would be one fifty five my time. Okay. Yes. Well here here's what makes me think that it's not an E flat because the first note of the piece is E flat and it's on a weak beat. And as we always say, at least in traditional music, you need to establish the key, right? Well, having the tonic on a weak beat does not establish the key. So you see, I think it's in some version of F. Personally, if we had more time, I'd show you by the end of the piece, it's in F Dorian. <laughs> now, then you go back and go, ah, what is A flat in the key of E flat? Subdominant, right? But what is the note A or A flat in the key of F? Minor third. Right, the third. It changes modality, right? right. If it's A natural, it's F major. If it's A flat, it's F minor. Mm-hmm. All right. So which of those notes do we have in the harmony? And you're going to have to look in the cornet, cornet part. Probably in, it's about bar 11 in first cornet. Do they have A natural or A flat? A natural. No, let's look at, make sure you're transposing. B flat, A flat, G. We see they have B flat, right? They have B flat, A flat, G, right? Descending in that, in the first coronet, right? So the, the first harmony is E flat, but then it's, it's an F minor sound. Now, Here's what's interesting. 
And by the way, if we smurf, what happens to before A? Uh, the clear that started to come in with the. No, theme. you're not smurfing, William. You're not smurfing. Rhythm. Rhythm. Da, 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 da. Now we have a, a rhythmic component in the piece. Now, what you're going to find out in this piece, because you've got a variation and the chaconne, is that not always is the most active part the most important. But look at the part at letter A. Do we have A naturals or A flats? A naturals. A naturals. Indeed. Hello. Do you see what he's doing? So he's using A flat in the beginning to create a tonal center, which is kind of F minor-ish or F Dorian. Mm -hmm. At letter A, look at that first, just mm -hmm. if you have C piccolo and C flute, look at that, that note that uh, measure at letter A. What does that, what chord does that outline? That's an F major chord. With? Uh, Minor seven. Flatted seventh, so a dominant seventh, F dominant seventh. At A, he's kind of in B flat. You see what I'm talking about? Yeah. So you see as the composer, finding that that A flat's missing, why? Now I got now I have to go through and see if that A flat or A natural plays a role. Does I see what I said from my opening from my opening um argument that um is this is this an initiation something that will be developed? Well it is. Does that all make sense? I mean it may be hurting your head right now. But <laughs> part of the smurfing is what do I want to bring out in my, in my conducting? So when rhythm becomes an aspect for wind instruments, then what do we have to deal with? Articulation. Uniformed articulation. So even though he says stack, staccato, how, you know, if I say play staccato, and you say, what's your def definition of staccato? Short, detached, separated. Okay, which one? <laughs> you have to make that decision. And then you have to make sure the articulation fits that. Does that make sense? Because you smurfed it. You still got melody. And in this piece, you're always going to have melody. Because it's a chaconne or some type of chaconne or reoccurring melody that's through the whole piece. Now, I would love to just take you through this whole piece and tell you what I've discovered, but we don't have time. And I want to leave some time for questions. And I've just kind of scratched the surface of this smurfing. But what the reason I'm saying that is if you could get a score and a recording to a piece of music. Now, I don't know how many of you were told never use a recording when you're studying a score. True. But use a recording when you're analyzing a score. Because you can smurf, your ear reacts quicker than your eyes. So get a score, get a good recording, and go through and smurf the piece by listening to it. Now, obviously, you're going to have to reset it and keep listening. and Then you can find out the important things to bring out in the piece, to teach to your students, and also how to develop uh, interpretation of the piece without writing one Roman numeral. And I've just scratched the surface, everybody. Sorry. Questions? If you have, any, if you have any questions, uh, turn on your mic or put it in the chat, and uh, we'll we'll definitely get to them. Um, Dr. Beach, I think you were about to say something. Yes, I definitely have a question. Um, so, uh, Dr. Stamp, um, how? What is your typical usage of the score on the podium, if any? And how do you typically mark your scores for use on the podium? I, that's a good question. I kind of mark them like I just told you Corporon's um, adage of, of okay. new, varied, repeated. I mark them like that. Um, also, I highlight, you know, major dramatic moments so I don't miss them. 
I use a score. You know, it was, there's an interesting thing about memorization. I know people that memorize scores for the sake of memorization. And what happens is when they conduct, there's a vision of the score running in their brain. And they're not really connecting with the ensemble. I'm not talking about the great, great conductors. But for instance, I can conduct this piece without a score. I can't conduct some of my own pieces that I've written without a score. <laughs> I'm serious. But I know this piece so well that I don't need the score to help me through it. I have it there because I probably don't have the rehearsal markings all memorized. But, but you have to have, you have to know the score well. If I remember when I was teaching in Pennsylvania, H. Robert Reynolds did the intercollegiate band. And I went to see a rehearsal. And I said, that was impressive. And this was only maybe 20 years ago. I said, that's impressive. Without it, you didn't use a score. And he goes, first time I've ever tried it. And I felt good about that. Because first time he felt like he knew the piece well enough that he could be over, um, away from the school, rather than memorizing for memorizing's sake. It's just that, you know, your, your head needs to, as Von Bulow, Hans Von Bulow said, the score needs to be in your head, not the head, your head in the score. And I think you have to be out making music with the ensemble. Does that yes. help? Yes, and, and so you would, you would not have it be cautious with the score rather than try to be ambitious and uh, showing off waste without. It's a waste of time. When you can be teaching the piece of music, you're too busy trying to recall it. Yes. Okay. That makes I'll sense. It, I'll take that to another level. Uh, uh, Dr. Stamp, if, if you were to experience a score for the first time, such as the, uh, the suite right here in the first one, the next time that you play it, would you go back to that same marked score or would you start with a fresh score? You know, that's interesting you say that. Obviously, if you're independently wealthy, you can keep buying new scores like Schulte used to do. Every time he went back to a piece, he got a new score. I do approach it, though, not like an old friend. Maybe like an old friend, but an old friend I haven't seen before. The first thing I do, actually, let's say I'm going to be a little bit more specific let's say i was going to do the hindemith symphony because that's a piece i haven't done as much as the holes first thing i would do is put on a recording of the hindemith symphony without the score and just listen to it because what that does is it takes my ears into hindemith land mm -hmm. and i get reacquainted with the piece without any distraction i'm just listening to the piece and trying to get back to hindemith then i probably won't listen to it anymore i'll Again, I'll do kind of what the, what the Batisti score study book says. I'll look at the score again like I was reading through a book. And if my markings, if, you know, sometimes your markings are reactions to your last rehearsal. Like, oh, I didn't think the trumpets were going to need that cue, so I'm going to mark that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I got to listen to that note because it was really out of tune. Sometimes you'll mark a score based on your last rehearsal rather than your final performance. Mm -hmm. So I agree, sometimes your score is marked and it makes no meaning the next time you do it. But I don't necessarily buy a new score because I'd rather spend the money on a, a score I don't have. <laughs> so, so you are careful not to use the recordings as a crutch as well? Well, the problem, you know, you know, people say, don't use a recording because you'll, you'll um, do that person's interpretation. Well, when you study a score, you're not listening to the recording. You're not conducting either. See, that's the problem. When people listen to the recording and they think they're studying the score, they're waving their hands. No, what they're doing is practicing conducting the piece. That's not studying the piece. You have to study the piece like you're reading a novel. And that doesn't mean you can, maybe if you want to spot check it on piano or the recording, say, I know I need to, I can't hear that quite. I need to hear that again. But the problem of setting the piece in motion with the recording isn't studying the score. I mean, when you read a piece, I mean, when you read a novel or you read a book, sometimes you have to go back and read it again because you go, well, now this is not context. Or who is this character? Did they bring them? That's score stuff. I think that says a not lot. And saying, I can't rewind. I can't rewind. Yeah. Uh, and I think a great example is that is listen to the host as many recordings as you can, and you'll hear interpretations each time. 
whether it's uh, Reynolds or Fennell or Cooperon or uh, Jerry Junkin, you know, they all have their interpretations in, in that recording. You know, the, there's a great quote in a book um, by Bruce Adolph. And I can't remember the name of the book. It's some wonderful thing. But he said, I don't interpret. Mine is the way it should go. <laughs> Everybody else's is an interpretation. <laughs> and that's the conviction you have to have as a, as a conductor. Absolutely. Any other? Oh, we have a question over here. Olivia? Turn Hi, your... Olivia. No? Okay. She came on. She just, she just kind of popped in. It's good to see you. Absolutely. Yeah, I've been working. We just had a major rush for two hours. So, yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, we are about four minutes to the hour. We're going to switch from conductor to composer. Uh, so, um, we can either take another question or uh, Professor Stamp, do you, do you need that? You want a couple minute break? I'm good. You're good? Yeah. Um, so I don't have to sign off to sign back in for this, nope, right? Nope, Same. Nope. We're just continuing yeah. on. All right. If, if you want to continue any of this, we can. But I mean, some new people may be coming in. We'll say, wait a minute, I want the composer thing. So. <laughs> Sounds good. We have no questions. All right. Actually, I have one more question. Okay. Sure. Appreciate Very it. Um, my first real conducting teacher always said that there were four pieces that were cornerstones of the wind ensemble repertoire and that they you should play them basically on a four-year rotation all the time the pieces being um first suite in e flat the second suite um and basically two pieces that i disagreed with <laughs> um but uh do you have any well i like, want to know what they were i want to know what they were um, one of them was like a Della Joyo piece. It was the like scenes from the Louvre, and which I, I, I mean, I do like that piece a lot. Um, I just don't think it's it's like a, a cornerstone um, necessarily, um, th though I, I I do like it. And the fourth piece is is totally es escaping me right now, but I, it, which just shows what a cruddy student I am, but. Um, I'm just curious if you had pieces like that that you think should be on a permanent rotation. Well, uh, sadly, you know, um, in fact, Dr. Phillips and I were talking about this. Back, I told him the first time I played the whole first suite was 1969. Now, if you want to do the math, that was 51 years ago. I was 15. I was a ninth grader in junior high, and our junior high band played it. Well, the problem is that most high school bands don't play that piece anymore. But I don't, in some ways, I don't think that piece is any more important to be played or to not be neglected. Is that a double negative? It is. As Toccata for Band by Frank Erickson or Overture for Winds by Charles Carter. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is, if you're really gonna be a band aficionado, the two whole suites are not his best piece for band. His best piece for band is a piece called Hammersmith. Yes. Which I is agree. much harder. But what we don't realize, because people don't study composers, they just study the piece they're gonna do. In fact, what I encourage, I just did one of these, um, when was it? Last, last, Last Wednesday, I did one of these for Lipscomb University down in Nashville. And I said, what you should do during this pandemic, everybody, is pick a piece that you love. Could be orchestral, could be choral, whatever. But not necessarily a piece that you would have the ability or the opportunity to conduct. So, Rite of Spring. Pick that piece, study it, analyze it as though you could conduct it, would have the opportunity to conduct it. 
you will grow so much as a conductor and musician from doing that. But the problem is, and the busyness of the school teacher, is that we, we only study to what we're gonna teach and we don't necessarily grow. And I go back to the first thing I said is, you pick the music that's gonna teach your students concepts of music. And certainly the whole suites do that. But there are a lot of other pieces too. I mean, I do, I do am afraid that some of these great pieces are gonna go extinct. We were just talking, again, Dr. Phillips and I were talking, Dr. Phillips went to um, uh, State University of New York at Potsdam, where my composition teacher was the teacher, Robert Washburn. No one knows the name Robert Washburn. His symphony for band is one of the best band pieces, I believe, written by an American composer. A three movement symphony, nobody knows it. And furthermore, it's now it's out of print and it's kind of on rental and nobody's ever going to know it. <laughs> and Fisher Tall, how many know that name? All these pieces, these great band pieces that came out in the 70s and 80s by really significant composers. Martin Mailman, Ron Nelson, um, Fisher Tull, uh, John Barnes Chance. Though he gets, he's hanging in there, Incantation and Dance. Mm -hmm. But how many it's, people do Blue Lake anymore? Or his Elegy? I mean, people don't do that. And so there's this body of really quality literature because it's not the newfangled thing, and I, I'm going to tell a story on myself a little bit. Not the newfangled thing. It doesn't have any cowbell, and it doesn't have a funk beat to it, you know. So it's, it's, not, it's not being discovered. And what I find, and what I, actually what I find distasteful is as a conductor and as a baseball fan is that current conductors and current baseball fans are not interested in the history. So, you know, I ask people that I see at baseball games or people that say they're baseball fans, I'll ask them a question about something about the game in history. They don't know anything. All they know is current players. And some conductors are that. All they know is the current big names that are writing music right now, and I'm going to play their music. And they don't know this plethora of music. Like you said, the whole suites, 1909 was when the first suite was written. It is a cornerstone of the modern wind band. And everything that came after that are so important to the history of, of the wind band, and that should be preserved. I finally remembered what the fourth one was. It, it was William Bird Suite was the fourth one. Terrific, terrific piece and a, and a wonderful teaching piece because, because you're teaching Renaissance music of one of the few British composers that actually survived in that time. You know, there weren't very many, you know, and I talk, when I talk about British music, I say, name the great romantic composers from Britain, classical and romantic composers from Britain. Purcell. You got Purcell and you've got Handel, who was really more international. No, it was, it was Germanically dominated. That's why British composers in the 20th century, kind of starting with Elgar, which is late 1800s. But they started to look inward at their, their folk song music and, and write music that was indigenous to the, to the British Isles and basically the UK. And that's why they did, were able to develop their own language. And that's pretty much what America did, you know, beginning with Copeland. And um, he, he wrote about America, where the earlier composers, kind of prior to Copeland, were all European trained. So they were European influence. But uh, my point is that um, the William Byrd Suite is a really good piece to teach with. Yes. I hate, I hate to interrupt. Uh, and uh, Dr. Beach, you and I have a long discussion of all this. because I, 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 was, I was only going to say one thing very, very briefly, just on, on what Dr. Stamp said very briefly. Then I promise I will cut my microphone off. Um, it's just about right of spring. And um, I just remember the first time that I looked at the score. Um, and it was, it was really an eye-opening experience for me. And, and though I... It's very possible I'll never get to play that piece of music or conduct it. It was truly, um, it was, it pushed me forward in terms of my conception of score study and analysis, I think. And I still keep it on my shelf, but that's, that's all. I'm, I'm out. <laughs> Turn it off, Bill. <laughs> to be continued, right. not out. 
So we're in the uh, three o'clock hour with no rest. We're going to continue on with uh, with Jack Stamp and one of his own, uh, Airlink. And I have the uh, score in the chat uh, that uh, he has made available to us. And uh, so moving on. Is, is, is there a list of questions? Yep. I'm, I'm going to put that in the... Yep. Right now, there you go. All right, so if you're, if you're with me from the first session, then this is gonna be kind of a continuous, continuization of that, but a, um, but a more personal approach to what I was talking about. If you weren't on the first session, I'll kind of catch you up as I go. You're not gonna be lost at all. But the first thing we'll do is we'll listen to Airlink. You should have a recording, right, Dr. Phillips? I am ready. All right, so follow the score, because I I'm, I'm, may ask you some questions. Here we go.
pretty good performance, huh? <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> it may be the best performance ever of any piece I've ever written. Wow. Amazing double I discovered, it. I discovered it accidentally. I was teaching a class in composition, and we were going to analyze a little bit. And I went online to actually um, Noxos Music Library, and that recording came up, and I didn't know about it. It's a, it's a Japanese defense minister band. Wow. And I found their address and emailed them, and they actually were kind enough to send me a Pardon me, send me a CD of it. And I, at back, actually, in, my, in the back of my mind, and soon, I'm going to write them a piece and give it to them for that. But that, that, I mean, it may be a little fast, just a little too fast, but it's a scary good performance. All right, anyway. So I'm going to talk to you, but I'm going to actually question you a little bit. What do you think the form of this piece is? Because that's important to understand the compositional process. Anybody got an idea? I know you've only heard it once. Intro ABA ish. Okay. Thanks, Evan. Anybody else? Intro ABA ish. Nobody? Okay. Dr. Phillips, would you make sure that they flunk this section of the, beat of the course? Yeah. Well, you know, I tell my students, my composition students, you don't have to sound like Bach or Beethoven, but you do have to think like them. So there has to be some type of form. Now, I understand why Eben said A, B, A, or whatever you just, whatever you said, um, cause there is a huge recapitulation, right? At, sorry, I don't know it well enough to know the bar number. Yeah. At, um, 191, right? The opening returns, but it's not sonata form. All right. Let's ask this then. How many themes are there? I mean, offhand, what do you think? Dr. Beach says three. Are you saying three or zero there, Olivia? Three. <laughs> Anybody else? Brooklyn says two. All right, I'm sorry, Kaylee says three. Are you being influenced by the crowd, Kaylee? And by the way, you're in the dark, young lady. Put on some light. Anybody else? I do have All the right. light. It's a, I'm in a kind of a dark area of my house. I apologize. All right. One. Who says that? Evan. Evan, wait a minute. You, oh, well, how can it be A, A, B, B, whatever you said if it's one theme? I know. <laughs> I think the sections, I think there are three main sections, but I think there's only one theme. Wow. So basically, you're saying I'm not a very good composer. <laughs> Thanks a lot. We'll talk about this later since I know you. Perfect. Actually, Eben is right. You see, what it really is, is motivic development. It's all based on ba, 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 ba. It's all based on everything comes out of the opening measures in the trumpet. Everything. Now there was a guy, let me think of his name. Oh yes, Beethoven, who wrote a piece that went ba 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 ba. He was the master of motivic development. I'm not, I'm not comparing myself to Beethoven at all. But really what this is, is a theme and variation with recapitulation in it, you see? So in other words, it's not a standard form, it is a piece that has form, that borrows from all the forms. So there's a, there's a motiv motive, sorry, a motivic development, and there are lots of variations on that motive, but sometimes those variations come back in various keys or, or things like that. So if you start thinking about the piece that way, that it's basically based on a motive from the opening, 
So now I'm going back to my compositional process. I was, this was a commission from Pennsylvania Music Educators Association. And I believe I have to look at, I think it was their 50th anniversary, maybe 75th, sorry, 75th anniversary. I have a funny story to tell you about that too. Um, they asked me, and I'll just tell you the number because it, you know, I'm 66 now. It doesn't matter. It's like old people can say anything and get away with it. And if Dr. Phillips doesn't want to invite me back, he doesn't have to. Um, but they said, we'd like you to write a, an, about an eight minute piece, seven, eight minute piece for PMEA to highlight our 75th anniversary. But all we have is $5,000. Now, I, I usually charge between $1,000 and $1,200 for a minute of music. So an eight minute piece would cost $8,000 or $9,600, depending on if I like the people or not. But I said, because it was Pennsylvania, that's where I was teaching. I taught there, had taught there for 20 some years. I mean, I actually taught there for 25, but during this, you know, it was 20 something. I said, sure, I'll write it. And the guy says, oh, good, because Sam Hazo wouldn't do it for that. Now, you probably shouldn't say stuff like that. Because actually, Sam studied with me. And so, of course, to give him a hard time, I call Sam. Sam lives in Pennsylvania, too. I said, Sam, I hear you wouldn't. They didn't have enough money for you to write for PMEA Allstate bands. And he went, what? And then I told him the story. He goes, and I know, I know, I believe Sam more than I believe the person that hired me to do this. He said, what I said was, well, my normal fee is this. How much money do you have? Which the, the person took as you won't write it for us. See, I didn't tell him my normal fee because he may have done the same thing to me. Anyway, that's how this came about. Now, at this time, I am dating my wife who lives in here in Wisconsin. There's a second marriage now for, for me, but, but I'd met this lady who lived in Wisconsin. I'm living in Pennsylvania. And I'm flying to, to Wisconsin or Minneapolis probably once a month. And when we got married, obviously I was doing that as well. But I took, this was before Northwest Airlines linked with Delta. And their commuter from Pittsburgh to Minneapolis was called Northwest Airlink. So that's why I named it Airlink. But then I have people say, oh, I can hear your relationship in this piece. The turmoil of being apart. And then that pretty middle section is you guys being together. Okay, sure. <laughs> but that's not what I had. If you think that, right, that's cool. I'm doing motivic development. So, I've, for some reason in my head, and I don't know why, I mean, because there are lots of other pieces, but I had Copeland's Fanfare for the Common Man in my head. But you know, Copeland's Fanfare for Common Man starts with just trumpets. And then it, it's two lines, and then it's harmonized, right? Well, I decided I was gonna do something between trumpet and trombone, but in contrary motion, that was pretty dissonant, pretty strident. So that's how I came up with this. And if you look at the trombone, it's pretty much the inversion of what the trumpets are doing. And that's the, that's the opening motive. All right, so then, when you get to five, da 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 dee da, da 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 dee da, you see it's augmentation of the rhythm. It's slowed down. And then it gets speed back up in six. Ba 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 beep ba. Is everybody with me? Yeah? All right. Now, tell me what he does, he being me. What does he do at measure eight? There are two things happening at measure eight.
So the and I'll even help you. The first thing, I'm sorry. The, the thing you have to decide is the alto sax and French horn and euphonium line versus the tuba timpani, Barry sax, bassoon and bass clarinet line. There are two things happening within that dialogue. Anybody got an idea? All right, for the it sake of time. It is a call and response, but it's almost canonic, right? Mm -hmm. yep, it but the problem is the lows are playing the inversion. So you've got the original in the horn and the alto sax in canon with the inversion in the, in the um, in the lows, why? Because then you see first clarinet and trumpets bring in the original again, delayed. Does that make sense? So you've got ba 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 Then once again, at the five four, ba 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 ba. Now it mellows out. But look at saxophone and. And clarinet, di da bo da da di da di da. Now it's just done as a as a lyrical melody, rather than as the bombastic opening. Again, same music. And then look what oboe does. At eighteen, oboe brings back the inversion, and English horn says, "No, no, no, no. This is the right version." But notice that. Earlier, the inversion was at three beats, right? The um, saxophone horn started on beat one, the lows brought in on beat four. Now oboe brings it on on beat two, and English horn brings it on beat four. It's two beats away now, and it still works. And then I bring them back together, see, in contrary motion. Then we've got this horn and euphonium duet which is pretty much harp harmonized like the opening, but a little more lyrical. And notice again, oboe and English horn rear their heads, but this time, um, oboe turns it right side up, English horn turns it upside down, and then flute turns it right side up. Make sense? Now, again, all I'm doing is manipulating, you see? Manipulating these dialogues with rhythm, with spacing, as far as um, measured spacing, but it's all the same stuff. Now I introduce a little bit of a new thing in the saxophones. Can anybody, I'm sorry, in the brass here, saxophones do it later. At 26, can anybody see what kind of harmony this is? It's not traditional triadic harmony. So you've got an A, an E, a D, a D, uh, an E, E, A. Yes, William, you said you weren't gonna say anything. Bill? You've broken your code of silence. Yes, it's quartal harmony. Now there's harmony based on fourths and fifths. It's quintal quartal. Why? Well, that, that's just a technique that, that tw especially 20th century composers use because it's not restrictive to key. It's pretty um, flexible. It's pretty non, I say non-descript or at least non-tonal. I, I don't mean consonant. I mean tonal as it, it identifies with the key. Now look at look at woodwinds. Put a little up bum. Put a little up bum. Ba do da dee. Ba do da dee. Put a little up dee. And I'm just I'm just extending. Ba da do da dee da. Ba da do da da do da dee da. Now look what happens at the six four. Are you up with me in bar forty two? What comes back now at a fast tempo? Ba ba ga dee da 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 dee da da. Right, it's the opening. 
just a just redone a little bit. Certainly, I don't think it's in the same key. I should look. I don't remember. No, it's certainly not in the same pitch center, right? Trumpets were on D at the beginning. Now they're on A. Anyway, so now I have a – so see, Evan would say, well, there's a recap there. You're right. But it's not sonata form. There's just a recap I bring back the beginning. So what that would be if you're doing corporon, repetition. Might be varied a little bit, but there's some repetition there. Now, if you look at trumpets at bar 45, da 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 Da, 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 There's the motive again, but now it's syncopated. And it's actually harmonized some polychords. Then I kind of go back to my, um, at 49, a little bit of rock and roll. That's where I said I was telling a story on myself. There's the cowbell. Da, da, ba, 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 be, ba, 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 be, ba, ba. And it modulates, right? Ba, 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 be, ba. Anyway, same thing, same thing. Um, a friend of mine, a composer I studied with, it's kind of interesting when you study with someone who's younger than you. Richard Daniel Poor is two years younger than me, way more knowledgeable than me. But I studied with him, and he told me he was influenced by the two Bs in music. Well, I was confused. Because I was always taught I'm doing Olivia now. There were three Bs. Three Bs were Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms. And he said he was influenced by the two Bs. And I said, two Bs? Who are you leaving out? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, Bach, Beethoven. And he goes, no, no, no. Beethoven and the Beatles. And people of my era, I grew up in the 60s and 70s. Blood, Sweat, and Tears, Chicago, Rock and Roll, the Beatles. Um, that is ingrained, especially those rhythms are ingrained in our head. Now, I don't think McCartney and Lennon would have ever written the harmony I wrote at 49. Blood, Sweat, and Tears, I doubt either. But they certainly might have written that rhythm. So there's an element of popular music in the late 20th century composers that has, that has this rock and roll element, popular music element. Now, if you look at, um, look at, um, I introduce a sax thing. Again, it's kind of the chordal harmony. Dee, dee, da, 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 da. And notice here comes that canon again. But this time it's a canon, but not, not with the inversion. See, if you look at 61, put a little up, up, but if put a little up, up in the lows, answer it. And now the woodwinds take what the saxophones had and the horns had a 60 and now the 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 brass one thing i haven't done is done the brass in the tune very much especially in unison in octaves now look at 73 right there it is Again, an augmentated version of it. All right, now we get into some form here or development here at 77. Here's a few. So notice that the first pitch the tuba comes in on is D. The pitch that the clarinet comes in on it and the French horn come in on is G. Is everybody with me? By the way, I'm at 77. Then at 81, flute, oboe, upper woodwinds come in on C. Now I'm not doing a traditional fugue, right? Because Bach would, if he Bach started on D, he would have gone to A and then back to D. I'm doing kind of a migrating fugue. It goes up a fourth, goes up a fourth again. But then what he does, he being me, if you can see what happens at 85, follow the quarter notes. Notice the flutes, oboes, F, F, G flat, F. Look at horn, F, F, G flat, F, and low brass. So what happens is the fugue, which is a fugue at two measures, 
turns into a cannon at two beats. Because now these are the same pitches, two beats apart, all playing the same tune. Everybody with me? What you should be saying is, wow. No, not necessarily. Anyway. Now I decide I have to do something slow. Now I extend it, probably the most I extend the melody, I extend it with a little bit more of a melodic feel to it rather than motivic feel. So if you were saying that this is, this is one of the melodies, you know, when you're thinking melody, I, I understand why you would say that, but it still comes out of that opening. Um, I'm checking my time. Okay, not bad. Um, so I'm going to kind of scoot through this, the slow section. But notice the what I'm proud of, of it, is, one, some of the repetition that it's almost like, I, won't, I don't want to say Wagnerian, but when the tune comes back, the actual tune comes back, it's in the same instruments. But the development happens, see, with, with horns, no trumpets, with trombones, darks, their horn, English horn comes back in. Now it's the English horn of bassoon. Then I add the oboe. Then I add the flute. And I have to tell you a quick story. The bar 118 to 122, which is clarinet, bass clarinet. I don't know if you know the name Bruce Yurko, composer. Probably his most played piece by school bands. It's called Night Dances. He's a dear friend. Bruce was at my house. And I was playing this for him as I wrote it. And this section from 118 to 122 was in English horn and bassoon. He said, we don't even use clarinets at all. You should end this, this whole section with clarinet. And I went, great idea. Because I was kind of close, too close to the piece to hear that that would make a, a nice color change for the last statement. And it just happens though, if you look, especially for bass clarinet, unless you have the extension, it goes to low E, which is a lovely sound of bass clarinet. So how do I get back to the fast? Well, saxophones at 123 is pretty much based on the fugue theme. Ba, 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 da, ba, ba, da, ba, ba. But that initially shows up in brass at, ooh, maybe it's more, I'm not finding it quickly. Uh, maybe it's it shows up certainly in saxophones at 60. D D da 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 da. Who has the melody at 124? Oh, come on. It's my, it's my homage to Vincent Persichetti. Paget. Go ahead, Bill. I, t is that, am I reading that? It's like wood blocks, tinder blocks? Is that Temple right? block. Temple blocks. Temple. Yeah. Okay. Right. It's actually in temple blocks. Then it switches Thanks. to keyboard percussion. Right? If you know Pageant by Persichetti, the fast section starts with drums going, snare drum going, da da da, da 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 Temple blocks because they can change pitch, which is cool. Obviously, it's not actual pitches, but they change timbral centers. So, temple block has it, then keyboard percussion. All right, I'm going to kind of wrap up quickly. So, we have another fugue, by the way, that happens at 147. The difference is that this fugue is accompanied, the last one wasn't. See, there's a bass line. See the the bass line goes 
four bars before it actually states the tune. Now look at 156. Ba 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 ba. It's the opening. But in woodwinds and in another me in another sorry rhythm. Now look at trumpet. Da -di -da 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 -da. You see that the trumpet is playing the English horn oboe melody from the middle, but it's in the um, I said from the middle of the piece, but and in from the middle of the from the middle of the tune. Da 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 di da 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 di. So I don't go ba da da. Why? Because I'm going to let the woodwinds do that in real time. Does that make sense? So you have ba di 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 di. Put a little up, put a little up. I, I can't say it's as cool as a simultaneous recapitulation, but at least two versions of the motive are going on. And one thing I didn't point out, and I should have, and I'm not sure I can find it quickly enough. Something kind of cool that I snuck in here during that, I think it was during the canon. Yeah. Um, no, it's, look at bar, can you find bar 68 and 69? Can you get to that, everybody? You see, you had brass going, this is where they're in unison in octaves. But a little up bump, but a little up bump, 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 And look at what tuba and, and lows do. Ba, 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 ba. Right, they're half as fast on the motive. They're in augmentation against, but a little up bump in the woodwinds. Well, that happens too at 178, 179. But then the rock and roll section comes back at 80. It's a different key. But so, so there is recap, see? Different key though. Then the tune returns in 191, but abbreviated, right? Most recapitulations, even in Marx, Mozart's time, were abbreviated. They weren't literal recapitulations. They're usually made a little shorter because they're coming towards the end of the piece. So again, that's the thinking like Beethoven, Bach, Mozart, but not necessarily sounding like them. And then the piece ends with the motive. Did a la ba put a la ba ba be ah ah, and then just this woodwind flourish at the end. But the whole thing. The whole thing is based on, uh, uh, all right, uh, 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 all based on that. And the ability to manipulate it. And how do I manipulate it? By Schmur. Sound, who I pick to play it. Not melody, because I, except sometimes I turn it upside down. Harmony. Absolutely, chordal harmony, triac harmony, polygord harmony, just intervallic, dissonance, contrary motion. Rhythm, big time. And the processes, see the formal processes, canon, fugue, imitation. All right, questions? Mind blown. <laughs> You know, the other thing about this piece, and I can't say it about all my pieces, everybody has a good part. Yeah. Everybody that plays, especially low people, like the low bass clarinets and all, they love this piece because they have some something to sink into. Mm -hmm. Thank you yeah. for that. <laughs> but it's not easy. But you don't have to play it at the breakneck speed that that Japanese band played it. Holy moly. Yeah. Well, folks, we have about uh, five, ten minutes uh, for questions and and thoughts. You know, I mean, and I don't think it's enough time. <laughs> but, oh, by the way, do you see what I'm wearing? There you go. 
<laughs> I'm wearing my Campbell Bands shirt that was given to me last November. I'm going corporate here. I'm wearing the <laughs> drinking the Kool Aid right now. We're gonna double your pay for this then. Excellent. <laughs> Hoping you say that. Uh, qu- uh any anybody? I'm I'm lost in myself as, and I, I got to go back to the feed here. Uh, questions from anybody in the chat or turn your microphone on. Feel free to to come out. Come on, Kaylee. Well, I was curious, like considering I'm a middle school band director, about adapting kind of like the Schmurf method for my students to look at their ensemble pieces this way, since it's at the moment not really sure what our ensembles and such are going to look like. So I would love to do so uh, uh, to do this with my kids, but to I guess put it in language that they're I guess a little more comfortable with at a sixth to eighth grade level, as opposed to like a lot right. of sitting in a. But I- but I think they can understand, you know, what instruments are playing, and you call that a sound. And yeah. melody, you could say, melody is the main tune. Who thinks they have the melody? Who thinks they have the harmony? Who thinks? And then you need to pick pieces, though, that have some type of formal structure to it, rather than A, B, A. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with song form, but a lot of times there's no transitions. And there's no yeah. development section or something, and maybe try to find a piece that's based on just a motive, or a piece that uses different harmonies and than just triadic harmonies. It, middle schoolers can play that. I, I wrote a piece. I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. Kid. I wrote a piece, and it was actually for the um, not sound power. What's I keep forgetting? Bruce Pearson's not essential elements, but it's something like that. Andrew. What's it called? What is it? Standard of Excellence. The standard of Excellence. They want me to write a piece for Standard of Excellence for young band. I wrote a piece called Fanfare, Song, and Fugue. Now the fanfare has poly, poly chords in it, all within the range of, of middle school young players. They told me that it was too contemporary. And well, what do you mean? So what it's it, those polychords. I said, but you asked me to write it. That's my language. So you want me to dumb my language down rather than making my language technically available to young players. And they didn't publish it. Now I got published by a by a publisher, a uh, Masters Music, which is a division of Calmus, which who knows if that music's ever gonna come back because they shut down. But point being is that one of the performances I'd sent it out and it was in manuscript and when I got to the rehearsal, the, the band director said, I fixed all those wrong notes. <laughs> and, you know, I'd heard stories like that that I thought were pretty funny. It's true. Any of the dissonances that were caused by polyharmony, he changed the note. So he rewrote the polyharmony. But my point is you, can, you need to find music that stretches their ears. But, and see, that's, that's the point of being able to write educational music. In fact, right. In fact, this flex idea that's going on right now, and that Frank T. Kelly has done, and John Mackey has done, I can't do it. I could not make Airlink work because of the sound factor. But to put my money where my mouth is, um, C. Allen Music asked me, would I be willing to write a piece, an original piece? starting from the bottom or beginning for flex instrumentation, I'm going to do that. And an easy, like a grade two, three piece. And I do have one that's called Prelude and Prelude and Dance. That's pretty easy that I wrote for a, it was a, it's called Dakota Christian Academy. And the, the band was 32 members from, and the band was made up from sixth graders to 12th graders. Think about oh, having my. a band like that and the, the wide disparity. So, that could be a possible. I have another piece called um, um, Song of Hope that originally was called um, Song for Newtown, which is for Newtown, Connecticut, where that massacre happened. And the publisher mm-hmm. said, you know, in 10 years, people won't know what Newtown is. So it made me call it Song for, for Hope. But it was written for like a sixth grade, seventh grade band. 
And again, it has some contemporary things in it. But right. Hey, Dr. You, Stamp. You your yeah, Evan. Um, uh, uh, three or four years ago, I had my band do a uh, fan first song in, um, in Pugue. And I did, I mean, I just went based on the score and the kids thought it was the coolest thing because it was so different for them. Um, that experience was just really, really good. Um, and I mean, they enjoyed it. And I, I mean, they knew like the music that I liked and stuff too. So, I mean, they were pretty excited for something. Right. I mean, it's, different it's not incomprehensible. I mean, that's the thing. But as a teacher, we have to, we have to enlighten our students. That's our job. Because I like the idea of like breaking down the whole like Schmurf method and make it like a unit for us to start with, especially since there's a strong possibility I might not see my kids person for a while to right. kind of break it down, get thinking about our pieces. And if we stay online, then we can work individually on these things with that process in mind or as we come together to have it like in one group so they can hear the sound once more, like that, all together. That's, I mean, that's a great way to approach it when you can't physically be with them. And one of the things that we can do with, in the Zoom experience with students is uh, take a piece like this that now we, we know much more in depth and, and simply ask a younger set of students, what do you hear? And then guide them into all these uh, intricacies uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Stamp has kind of led us through. And I think that's another great way to open their ears and experience so they can try and do that again. By the way, I, I meant to, and if you want to, if you want to email me, I'll send you this, this actual part of the handout, which I don't give to the people yet. I want them to try to find it, but there are actual, actually 64 iterations of that motive in that piece. Wow. Some form 64 of them. And in all 12 pitch centers. So they all start on one of the 12 pitches that every pitch center is hit in those motives. I didn't set out to do that. It just happened. But as we run out of time, I, I have one question, but I want to save if anybody else has a question they want to ask uh, uh, Professor Stamp as we kind of close out here in the last eight minutes uh, to the hour. If anybody has a question, and oh, yeah, um, uh, Dr. Stamp, I know I've I've asked you this. Um, do you feel uh, like the way that we teach theory and analysis, um, either where you're talking about AP music theory at the high school level or undergraduate level, do you think it should be taught differently? Um, well, I'd say what I think, Evan, is that theory four should break off and there'd be a music education section of it, a music performer section of it, and maybe the general music approach. And that, that's where you teach the music educators to analyze it like a teacher. You teach a player to say, oh, how do you take your part and integrate it theoretically into the, into the piece? And if they're, if they're direct theory, then you go on with the typical, typical theory four, but you know what? You, we could we could squeeze it, you know, some of contemporary harmony, which we don't get to much. Talk a little bit about sometimes 12 tone, but by the third semester, then the fourth semester, make it functional theory. That's what I wish. And I tried to do that, but you know, our th the theory professors, man, they're like, they just hold their fort, you know? <laughs> but, the, but the idea, you know, the idea is let's, let's be practical with theory. I think you need to know all the other stuff, but then how do you apply it? We never have time to teach that. And I think there should be a, the theory class, the fourth semester should be the application of the theory skills within the discipline that you're studying. Incredible. Dr. Stam, thank you so much for all this information. Uh, I think it was the first time that in three days, it was a, a solid two hours of mind blowing information. <laughs> you were gonna ask me a question though. Right? I did, I did wanna ask you a question. So it has to be quick. I'm actually doing the next session at four o'clock. Oh. So, um, I have to uh, make the switch. Um, but as uh, you know, thank you from the profession for uh, 
creating such fresh music uh, for the wind and for the wind band. Uh, and in that, thank you. When you have an organization that uh, asks you uh, uh, for a commission work, uh, what do you want them to provide you as a composer? Um, I know yeah, well, the first time. Right. And, you know, not necessarily the, the grade level and all that stuff, but, you know, writing a piece of music, I mean, that's a 360 no, I, degree question. You know, and sometimes they say, I don't, we don't care what you write. They might say a slow piece, fast piece, but what the information I want from them is what's their instrumentation? Who are their best players? Who are their weakest players? What don't they have? What do they have? And because I feel like when I'm commissioned, I'm not writing for Neil Cho's music publisher. Mm -hmm. 